Well, hello, mother dear. We're back again on day two of your life story. <laughs> um, so yesterday we kind of went over the basics of your family and where they came from and the different farms in South Dakota and the lovely Milesville farm ranch that was out in the dry land. Talked a little bit about Selby and Gettysburg where you spent most of your childhood, but today we're gonna circle back to Selby and have a lot more specific memories of what went on because that was mostly during the war, a lot of it. And so you are going to tell us some of those more interesting details and probably, well, why didn't you tell me that questions? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Is that good? You want to do that? Sure. That's what I have in mind. Okay. So we want to start with our first slide. Okay. That one is, that's Grandma Bell. So yeah. tell me about this picture. Well, Grandma Bell is <coughs> um, on the farm in Iowa. And this was when Louie was very ill. But she is emptying the laundry tub, which was also the bathtub. <laughs> and that's, that's what big people took baths in, too? Well, what was the option? Well, you'd have get to in stand the horse there. Tank? Get in the horse tank? I don't think so. Yeah. So she's emptying that. You can see Barbara leaning over behind the uh, wash tub. Luann is in the right side of the picture. Who, who's the and man? And the hired man. The hired but man. But <clears throat> after Louis died, Belle moved to Selby and lived with us for some time. Oh, okay. And she stayed in Selby and, and would uh, rent a room from different people at different times when our house <laughs> got full. <laughs> so it, it seemed to work out very well. Okay. So then you see the water pump in the front of the picture. That's the source of water in that. Is that in That was the, the farm? main source of water. And that's where the threshers would clean up. And oh. that's where we got the water for the house and the bath and the laundry, etc. Okay, so there was no indoor plumbing in that farmhouse? No. Okay. Another outhouse to go to. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> oh, how much fun is that? Okay, well, that's kind of interesting. Okay, now we're going to bump to the next one. So this is the house in Selby, where this was the one we bought for $1,000 and had to do a lot of rehab in it. But that's where so much of my younger years were spent. Um, and it has a lot of memories. Yeah. It's of things we did as children uh -huh. and growing up kids. Okay, so I guess you're gonna launch into that, aren't you? This is the garage that went with the house. In the background, you can see the barn made of cement block. You can see chickens. You can see our swing set that dad had made for us. So grandpa and made that swing set? <clears throat> Okay. Plus, there I am on stilts. We had been <laughs> to a little carnival that came to town, and there was a man walking on stilts. And I was so intrigued with that that I had Dad make a pair of stilts so we could learn to walk on stilts. And it was a few falls, and then you got the hang of it, and we walked all over with our still son. <laughs> so you are almost as tall as the garage door on those stilts. Right, yeah, they were fairly tall. How many so, um, major falls did you take? Well, you... nothing serious, uh -huh. just a learning fall. Did Barbara try it? Barbara tried it, and Luann tried it, so we all used him. Okay. I remember Chris had some when he was a kid. Right. Didn't Dad make them for him? Probably, yeah. 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 It was two by fours and a wedge. Yeah. Oh, that's hilarious. All right. Oh, and now we pop to another picture of the three little girls in their matching 
daisy dresses in front of a bush. My mother, <laughs> where she was, she sold practically everything we wore. <clears throat> and she would buy the enough fabric to get three dresses out of it. Mm -hmm. And we were frequently dressed alike. So that made people think we were twins or triplets. And um, look at <coughs> your knees and Luann's knees got some little <coughs> scabs on them. Oh, yeah. We roller skated, had one pair of roller skates, and they were the kind that you clamped on with a key. Yeah. And the sidewalks were not real smooth in those <laughs> days. <laughs> so well, there, was, there was a lot of falling and scraping of knees. Yep. But sometimes you got to put a Band-Aid on it, but mostly not. Because <laughs> Band-Aids were expensive. Yeah. Yeah. We had so. a pair when, we, when I was young. That right. And our really uneven sidewalks in Billings, Montana. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They were smoother than the ones I grew up with. Were they? <laughs> yeah. God. So. Okay, so you guys just kind of shared skates. Did you go down to, was the playground asphalt or not? That's Oh, like heavens school? no. Okay. So, have we got any more school pictures there? I don't think so. Maybe not, but, <clears throat> oh yes, here's my. First day of school must have been second or third grade. Dad always took a picture of us. Here you are, standing in front of a bush. Right. Yeah. No. So, um, so I guess I'm jumping ahead about asphalt on playgrounds. <laughs> Pardon? Asphalt on playgrounds didn't exist till much later. Oh, heaven, it's <laughs> no. Well, when we were at school, the games we played... Uh, were squeezer, squasher, apple saucer, and that's you would go to school, and they wouldn't let you in until eight thirty. So the kids were all milling around, and when the bus arrived with all the country kids, we'd all line up, and in a row, with a, <clears throat> our backs to each other, and then we'd go back and forth, squeezer, squasher, apple <laughs> saucer. And the one at the back really got squashed. Oh my God. So then they would come to the front and we'd rotate all the way through until the bell rang and we had to get into the schoolroom. So then you kids would, you, <coughs> you city kids would go rotate and go through the squeezer squasher tunnel? Yeah. Oh, well, that's nice of you. <laughs> you didn't just torture the country kids? No. <laughs> we were all, all in the same situation. Yeah. The classrooms usually had a bat and ball. And so at recess you could play a uh, softball. And you had to choose sides and you always hoped you weren't the last one chosen. <laughs> I'm sure so you weren't we, because you were kind of a tough girl. I was usually the second or third one chosen. Oh yes. wow because I was kind of a tomboy, yeah. and I could hit the ball because we had a bat and ball at home. So okay. I was good for being a girl. <laughs> <laughs> and the other thing, the schoolyard had a big swing set, it had a trapeze, and a couple of swings, and a teeter-totter, and a slide. So that was the equipment on the school ground, which was the gravel area. In the winter time, we would play fox and goose, which meant when the snow was on the ground, you could make a, tr a puzzle pack. And it was a big square with a horizontal line through the middle and a vertical line and two diagonal lines. And then in the center was the fox. And the goose would come up the path and try to taunt the fox to chase the goose. And if the fox caught the goose, the goose would have to be the next fox. <laughs> and so there were endless hours of fun playing fox and goose at school. 
Well, what about all the other kids around the perimeter? Is it like a bunch of geese or just one at a time? Oh, you went, uh, you kind of ran, were distributed around the uh, path and would come in from different angles. So the fox would always be trying to catch somebody when there okay. was somebody else coming up behind him. All right, that's what I was wondering if there was <coughs> somebody, a goose on almost all those pathways. Yes. At the, you know, so oh, it's yeah. like, who does he go after? Who's the slowest goose? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah. that was a fun winter game. We did a lot of that. Yeah. And we also at home played hopscotch. Oh. It's, yeah. We had somehow gotten a piece of chalk Ooh. where you could make the hopscotch squares and you had a special stone or <clears throat> if you were lucky you found a piece of broken coke bottle that had been sort of worn down. Oh. That was a prime uh, stone to use. So what did you do with the stones? Well, you'd throw them up to the next number. You were numbered the squares. Well, I know that much. Uh, one to ten, and you would start and throw your stone, and the number it landed on, you had to go pick it up by hopping and one one foot to follow the numbers to get to your stone. Well, what about the hopscotches that have sets of two? You go hop, yeah. hop, 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 two feet, hop, yeah. hop, two. Did you have those? Yeah. Okay. That's how we made them. So it was endless hours of playing hopscotch through so, the years. So did you intentionally <clears throat> throw them really far or close? or how, And how many numbers of hopscotch did you have? There were ten. Only so ten? So you'd like to get up to ten, and then you could win. Oh, the first so whoever... one to get to ten would oh, win. Okay. Yeah. So if you're really good at tossing your stone, you could get up there faster. What if it rolled out of the box? You lose you lost your turn. Lost your turn. <laughs> lost your turn. Of course. <laughs> so we also played a lot of jacks, hmm. and got fairly good at it. And we did jigsaw puzzles. Well. The in jacks, the were they wood? Are they metal? Because they were the little metal jacks. Okay. Hard to describe them. I don't them. remember how that game works. Well, you throw the jacks and you bounce the ball and see how many jacks you can pick oh. up before the ball comes back down. Oh. So that got to be rather tricky. You had to judge how high to make the ball to get how many jacks. So did people sometimes intentionally just wham the jack's ball down and make it go really high and then it would probably... Well, you had to catch the ball when it came down. Yeah, well, then you would be really screwed, wouldn't you? <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. we, we rarely had um, toys to play with. Mm -hmm. We would get... Uh, for the children, we might get... a a crossword or a jigsaw puzzle at Christmas. Okay. And then we would sit at the table and put that jigsaw puzzle together. I don't know how many times, but sometimes you'd get a new one one year. Why, did you like to exchange them with neighbors every, every year? <laughs> no, we didn't do that. Well, because remember and patents, we used to give each other yeah. puzzles at holidays and go to each other's house and make them. Yeah. That's probably where we got that interest is because of you. Probably. Yeah. And then um, <laughs> we had a set of pickup sticks. Oh. Like sharp on both ends mm -hmm. and any more. Osha would say, no way can kids have pickup sticks. Well, because you threw them down in a pile on the floor, yeah. and then you took one of the sticks and you flipped them up so you could see how many you could flip up without disturbing the pile. 
We so, had that game because then we played yes. it in the living room carpet because it was sticking right. in the carpet. Well, it's something we played. Because you didn't, it was just on like <clears throat> the hardwood floors or, out, yeah. or outside. Yeah, yeah. But. So Christopher has a question. Yes. Hello. Yep, go ahead. Well, Mom, I, I hear you talking about all these fun things that you did as a kid, but I don't hear any mention of music. Oh, well. So did, you, did you play music? Did you sit around and sing songs? Did Howard and his cow hams have a bluegrass band? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's back up to school then, to the classroom. Okay. Um, if the teacher knew little songs and ditties, we would sing. And one time we had a rhythm band. I think it was probably the music teacher for the high school that would come over maybe once a week and she would play the piano and pass out the rhythm instruments like a drum and a triangle and a, um, what do you call those shaker things? Oh, tambourines. Tambourines, yes. Mm -hmm. And so you had to take turns playing the rhythm instruments and she'd play the piano. So that was music in the elementary schools. Did, what but, kind of songs did you sing? Do you have any recollection? Not really. Okay. I don't. Yeah. Yeah. So huh. then the other music we listened to was on the radio on Saturday morning. There was a symphony. I think it was one of the broadcast companies had a symphony and they played music, classical music, on Saturday morning. Oh, boy. So we would turn that on, <laughs> listen to that. It wasn't the Metropolitan Opera being broadcast on Saturdays. <laughs> well, sometimes uh, they would uh, run an opera. Yeah. So that got kind of long, Yeah. shall we say. Yeah. Did you have another comment, Chris? I was just going to ask, this is a, a subject that's going to come up later when she decided to go to college as a music major. Oh, so, that yeah, will come up later. Yeah. Go ahead, keep going. All right. I just had to throw that in. Gotcha. Well, then one of the other things we did to entertain ourselves outside, um, we would play a lot of tag around the house. I mean, hide and seek and tag. Every time you went out, all of a sudden, you'd be it for tag. <laughs> Somebody would say, so you're just, it. Okay. You girls, or was it like neighbor kids too? Well, anybody. All right. Sometimes it just us girls, but a lot of times the neighbor kids were there too. Okay. And <clears throat> we'd play hopscotch with the neighbors and, uh, basically things like that. Mm -hmm. But we spent time with the chickens and we had to pick the eggs and kind of take care of the chickens. And we had a victory garden for, during the war, they called them all victory gardens because you were supposed to um, grow your own food. So we planted a lot of potatoes in the spring. And then as the potatoes grew and the blossoms came on, the potato bugs would come along with the blossoms. Oh. And if you didn't pick the tomato, uh, potato bugs off, they ate the blossoms. You would have no potatoes. Are those so, the roly-poly bugs? No. No, they're different? Okay. I, I don't remember what they looked like. Okay. But we would all get a jar of, with a little kerosene in the bottom and we'd have to go out in a potato patch and pick potato bugs every morning. Wow. And put them in the jar with the kerosene, that killed them. Did so, you light it on fire afterwards? No. <laughs> I, I don't know what happened. That would be hilarious. <laughs> you just have a torch. <laughs> well, maybe it went into the trash barrel and 
lit was lit there because oh. we had a, a trash barrel out back, which is a burning barrel. Yeah. Yeah. They didn't light so. it on fire because they were girls and not boys. <laughs> Did you hear that? No. You said you didn't light it on fire because you were girls and not <laughs> mischievous boys. Yeah. Okay. And then all the thing we spent our time doing in the, in the summer, <coughs> we had a little grove of chook cherry trees out on the other side of our property. And Luann and I built ourselves a tree house. Now the tree house, <laughs> was not one of those you see on TV these days. <laughs> the tree house was a piece of scrap lumber that we picked up and fitted across the branches of the chook cherry tr trees. It went across two trees and you could climb up on it and that was our tree house. How get big there. a piece of lumber, how wide was it? <laughs> oh, it was probably five or six feet long. Okay, and then how wide? How fat? Well, just probably a two by six. Oh, so just enough to sit your bum just, on. Just, huh? That's all we needed. And we'd sit up there and make up stories and <laughs> about being in Hollywood, being glamorous. And <laughs> because we go to the beauty shop once in a while to get a haircut, and they had Hollywood glamour magazines. So. Oh, my. So you and Luann would look at them and just, like, dream about, oh, what it would be like if you were all glamorous. And yeah. And when Barbara and Corbin used the treehouse, too, but Luann and I were the ones that built it. Oh, how did you secure it to the tree limbs? We didn't. It just fit in there. <laughs> okay. It didn't fall off, so that was fine. All right. Well, you were lucky that was the right length and the right width of those tree limbs to fit into. Then in the winter, oh, we got in trouble for this because we had a cistern outside the house, and when it rained, all of the rainwater would run into the cistern. Mm -hmm. And, of course, in the winter, it would freeze. Well, one winter day, the neighbor kids were over, and we were all outside playing, and Mom and Dad had gone someplace downtown. So us kids were just out in the yard playing. And we decided we'd get in the cistern, because it was frozen. <laughs> well, we didn't know how thick the ice was. We never thought of that, or how deep it was. So <laughs> all of us kids piled down into the cistern. <laughs> and when my dad came home, he took a picture of us. I wonder where that picture went. That's interesting. <laughs> I have no idea. But oh, were we scolded. Oh my. Was it? You do not get in that cistern. You don't know what else is in there. Oh, the Loch Ness Monster might have found his way there. <laughs> you don't know <laughs> if how deep it was frozen. So, so you guys were all in there sitting on top of the ice? Yes. And you didn't? And our head. We were down far enough, so just our heads showed. We must have had a box that we put in there to get in and out. <laughs> <laughs> that was one of our winter games, but huh. we didn't get to do it. I too. wish oh, I'd be so great to see that photograph somewhere. Well, oh, I remember it, but I also remember the scolding we got. Yeah. yeah. And all the neighbor kids, too. Well, because if it would have started the water seeping up, you guys could have gotten stuck in hypothermia. Oh, that would have been bad. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. plus, if we had closed the lid... What? Nobody would have known we were in there. Why would you close the lid? Well, I don't know, just to see how dark it was, probably. <laughs> but you didn't this time. No, we did not close okay. the lid, All right. ever. Oh, jeez. But it was... Half the, half of the opening and on a hinge. Okay. So, so it was a half hinge open lid? Yeah, like we could close it, keep it closed unless it rained. But the rain gutter went into it. And that was water for the garden. Oh, okay. Yeah. Wow. That's funny. Uh, should we see what the next picture is? 
Oh, oh, that's a sled. Another one of our winter fun things. Um, notice how we're really bundled up. <laughs> Who is that? Luann and no, that's me and Barbara. Barbara. Well, there was this big pond out of town, a ways, and it froze over in the winter time. And when it was 20 below for a week at a time, it was pretty solidly frozen. <laughs> yeah, I would think so. So Dad would say, okay, kids, let's go uh, to the pond. And we'd put the sleds in the car. We had two sleds and a rope. And we'd go out to this pond. Mother would go along. Sometimes we had sandwiches out there. And um, he would hook the sleds to the rope and hook the rope on the back fender of the car. Then, then he would drive around the pond and we would be swinging around <laughs> back and forth on the sleds. It was just more fun. <laughs> it's like, okay, Chris has a comment. Can I, can I say something? Yes. This is Christopher again. Uh, your dad sounds really fun. He sounds like you really engaged through all of your lives when you were growing up and did a lot of things with you. What? He said <laughs> you. That was, that was exactly the kind of maneuver that my father would have yelled at somebody. Hey, you idiot. Don't drive around on the ice and pull a sled full of kids. <laughs> <laughs> Funny how things go for us full circle, but yeah. your dad sounds really cool. <laughs> <laughs> but remember, Chris, that dad used to pull us around the block cookie bobbing from that old Renault and, yeah, yeah, and our plastic boots. <laughs> <laughs> and, and now we know why. <laughs> Both of our parents were idiot daredevils when they were young. <laughs> Well, some things right, <laughs> some things pass down. <laughs> yeah, some things do pass down. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. So then, this is all going on during the Second World War, and one of Dad's uh, programs that he brought to the county was 4-H Club, which was teaching young people how to do the skills needed to keep the country going during the war while the adults were off fighting. And um, they had a girls 4-H club, they had a boys 4-H club. And the boys 4-H club dealt with animal husbandry and with their sheep and their cows, their calves, pigs, pigs, chickens, and um, the girls learn to sew and how to set the table and how to um, wash dishes properly. Oh God! <laughs> All of these little skills were taught skills, mm -hmm. and you had to do a demonstration of a particular skill at a meeting. So we would have a meeting, I think well, probably once a month, at somebody's house. And one of the demonstrations I gave was how to set the proper table. And a lot of those families really just put the silverware on any old way, and it was helter-skelter. In some of the places that we would go, and if you happened to be there for a meal, they didn't set the table the proper way. <laughs> oh my goodness, but improper. We did learn a great deal, especially about sewing. Mm. And then the other skill was judging. They would have the county fair once a year mm. where the 4-H clubs would be a big part of that. And he would display maybe a dress that you had made 
or a sh uh, skirt, skirt napkin if you had hemmed on the sewing machine, very basic skills. And everybody would make a dress to bring. Mm -hmm. Everybody would bring hemmed dish towels or napkins to be judged. So much had to be judged for quality. And that was a very uh, valuable lesson. One time, one of the stores brought over a bunch of shoes, and we had to judge shoes. And that one was really kind of tricky. How do you judge shoes? Well, you had to look at the sole. You had to look at the uh, heel to see what it was made of, how it was attached, if they were tacked on or if they were sewn on. It was a quite a learning experience to judge something like that. But during the war, I would think there would be very limited amount of shoes and styles to available. Well, there they were limited, but you had to learn to judge them. Huh. The other thing then, the, the boys for each club had to learn to judge cattle, quality cattle, and sheep, and the wool on the sheep, and the chickens, and the eggs that they laid, and hmm. it was a very good learning experience. Yeah. And then in the summer, we would go, if you were lucky and could afford it, you would go to 4-H camp for three or four days. Huh. That was a big deal. We went over to this lodge on a lake about 40 miles away did and spend three or four days doing activities. Did you guys get to go ever? We got to go, yes, we did. But you had to take your, they had cots for us to sleep in or bunk beds. But you had to take your own bedding and your uh, very essentials, yeah. which wasn't like traveling today. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. So that was always a big deal. But then during the war, um, it was recycle and reuse, definitely. Well, I think part of your 4-H stuff, you ended up going out to Milesville and I've just switched to a, a photograph of <laughs> mom being a farm girl out in the ranch. <laughs> this was my father's ranch. That is his brother Howard. And this was after the war. And I was oh, determined. After. Okay. I was determined to be a cow girl. And so I stayed out there for several days and which was quite a trick because yeah. they had to come back and get me. And it was quite a ways. So there was an old pair of cowboy boots that I <laughs> I fit up from up in the attic. Oh, jeez. Look at the rolled up jeans. <laughs> they um. were, it was a, <laughs> a real experience to so stay. At that point you could take all your 4-H experience learning and go out to the ranch and figure out how to do the male parts <laughs> the, the judging and the well, cows and everything. Well, they had an old nag of a horse that I got to ride. Mm. Learned how to saddle it and okay. how to ride horseback. Yeah. I had that hat. That's pretty cool. I don't know where the hat came from. Well, it's probably but in the house, too. Here is a float for the 4-H day to make the best better. And we, oh, the symbol of the logo for the 4-H was green. And we stuffed so much green paper, <laughs> crepe paper, into a chicken wire to make that, <laughs> that it was a fun project for all of the kids in 4-H club. 
everybody participated in it. So you guys had a 4-H float in, is what, was it like a 4-H parade or was it a 4th well, of July it was, parade? Or? It was a parade. It was the big county fair parade. Oh, the county fair parade, yeah. okay. That's where they did all the judging of the cattle and the sheep. I see on the Barron's Hotel and Lounge with a little shamrock, but only a three leaf. What? So it's only three leaves, not four. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's a pretty good old school. So. Yeah. And during the war, they recycled so much. The kids around town would all compete to see who could get the biggest tinfoil ball, which meant picking up cigarette cases because the cigarettes were wrapped in foil mm -hmm. and gum was wrapped in foil. So every little single bit of foil was put in a ball and who had the biggest ball was <laughs> <laughs> when they did the takeaway of all of the uh, re recycled farm gear. Yeah. Uh, this is the 4-H part of the uh, county fair where the boys have their sheep and occasionally if a girl was uh, raising a sheep, she would get to be part of the show. Yeah, because there's a girl at the end of the at line the there. At the end, yes. Huh. But, and then the sheep had to be sheared, of course. Oh, yeah. I'm and sure. When they... When the sheep were sheared, they all brought their wool to the train station and put it in great, huge, long burlap bags. And we have a picture of that coming up. Okay. And so. then us kids would go down to the depot, and after they've gotten some wool in the bags, they would we would have to get in and stomp the wool down so they could get more wool in. Because then the heavier the bag, the more money they got. Right. So you wanted to, those bags as heavy as possible. Hi, did you get lots of lanolin on your skin or oh, was well, it dirty? Of course, it was, <laughs> it was dirty, but it was softened your skin for sure. Yeah. Back yeah. to the forage play, parade then. These were the cattle, and they all had to bring their cattle in, and their so, cattle were trained, more or less, to be uh, domesticated a little bit so they could be brought into. So they walked this cattle down the street in the parade? Yeah, of course. Oh, okay. Yes, of course. So you have to learn mostly older how kids to with the cows, though, because they're big animals. Well, they had to learn to judge from the out looking at the cattle of, on the outside um, how well they were, how uh, how good quality they were. Did they check their teeth like they do with horses? <laughs> I don't remember that, <laughs> but they checked everything else for sure. There's a few, handful of girls in that picture. And most of those were Herefords, yeah. which was a uh, common beef cattle at the time. Yeah. Well, and there are a couple girls in there that have their calves. Mm -hmm. All right, now you can talk more about the, <laughs> the wool. wool. This is a picture at the train depot, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, with all of the... People with their wool, getting it into sacks. And notice the cars, the vintage of the cars. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of old school. Well, I don't see any kids jumping into any of those bags, though. Well, I didn't get a picture of that, but <laughs> when the bags were upright and they were stuffing the wool in. They're pretty big. So they would collect wool all along the way as the, the, the train would pick up wool all along the way during harvest shearing time, you know. So they had a route they went and they stopped at all these depots at a set day or time and... Well, yeah, you knew when the train would be in and you could put your wool on. Okay. Yeah. 
So, yeah, bet some areas had more sheep than others, though, huh? Yeah. Yeah. That's fascinating. Well, I mean, it was essential. Well, didn't they do that up um, where the Bear Museum is, up by Harleton and oh, yeah. Martinsdale? They had big, the yeah, same thing that's, happened. Uh-huh, Charlie Bear. Yeah. Had he the, had enough sheep to fill 40 freight cars with wool sacks. 40 freight cars? And this was during the war. During the so war. So they needed wow. the wool for uniforms. Yeah, sure, sure. Wow. wow. Yeah, that must have had been all the acreage in Martinsdale and Harleton and Judith Gap and everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And then there was the rodeo. Oh, we don't know anything about the rodeo. Don't have any pictures of the rodeo. When it was, no, we don't. Um, and this goes back to actually almost preschool, but early school age. Mm -hmm. Fourth of July would come around, and the cowboys would all get together and have a rodeo. Mm -hmm. They, for the corral, they put up snow fence, okay. which, to make the area for the corral so they could have the bucking horse contest, and it was a wild time because everybody came, parked around the fence, and drank beer, whiskey, whatever they wanted. He got fairly drunk and got on the horses and got bucked off. Of course. And one horse um, was so spooked that he jumped over the fence onto a car and took off over the hills. Wow. <laughs> he was a black horse, and I remember that. Fortunately, it was not our car that they jumped onto. <laughs> yeah, because I can so imagine. That was friends. a very long, late, exciting day. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder and, if they ever caught that horse. Oh, of course they did. Yeah. They had to go round him up. Yeah. Wow. With somebody's good horse. Yeah. So, Mother. What? Mother, would it be fair to say that that was your first rodeo? Yes, that would be fair to say. My first rodeo. That was her first rodeo, but man. Yeah. Just, just checking. <laughs> good, good call there, brother. Thanks. <laughs> oh, that's so fun. let's move on. Okay, so now we're done with Selby pictures. What well, else did you want to talk about the war effort? Oh, on the war effort, is there a picture of the scrap metals that... Did we get that one in there? Um, anyway, during the war effort, they had a, a metal mm -hmm. drive where uh, huh, I guess I the didn't. farmers would bring all of their junk, uh, metal junk that was not usable anymore, mm -hmm. machines that were broken down, couldn't be fixed. They brought them all into town, by, put them by the railroad, and uh, then the Railroad picked it all up at one time, so every town had uh, a war drive to get rid of all of the scrap metal that they could, so they needed it to make guns. Mm -hmm. So, Well, that's that a double-edged sword because they could have gotten rid of some cool old artifacts. <laughs> You know, that you can decorate your front yard of your cabin with. <laughs> <laughs> well, probably a lot of it went to the war effort, but there's still enough around. Well, there's enough those uh, rural junkyards, you know, out there in the middle of nowhere today right. where there's junker cars sitting in these fields because you got to pillage them for parts. Yeah. <laughs> if you've ever driven through eastern Texas, they have enough for certain the world. Oh, do they? <laughs> okay. So. All right. But we had already talked about the education yeah. in the school system, which was dismal. True, true, true. <laughs> but one more thing before we leave Selby was they had the office at the courthouse. 
he, it was a lovely courthouse and it had marble, double marble staircase to go up to the second and third floor. And the courtroom was just off my father's office. Okay. And we would sneak into the courtroom. It was not being used most of the time, <laughs> but we would go sit in the judge's chair. <laughs> oh, you would. <laughs> and we were just kind of hoping nobody would come and find us. But then we would skitter out and go back to Dad's office. You which, didn't play like you were the judge sentencing somebody? No, we didn't make any noise. Oh, we okay. didn't want to get caught because there were other offices around. Okay. <laughs> and so I don't know that we were ever any help to my dad in the office. <laughs> but it was a, uh, a nice adventure to go into that lovely courthouse and go up those marble stairs. <coughs> Yeah. And they had all these great marble banisters that were just wanting to be slid down. Oh, gee. And but, I'm sure little rascal didn't do that. But there were always people in the courthouse offices, and they would have just kicked Dad out, no doubt. <laughs> oh, I doubt it. They would have said that was kind of funny. But no, it was tempting, but we did not do it. <laughs> oh, that's a bummer. Yeah. All right. So you and lived then in the jail house was next to the courthouse. And when we were out on the courthouse lawn, we would walk over to the, the jail and peek in the windows to see if there was anybody in the jail. And <laughs> oh, God. the jail house the cell windows or just the off the It had the bars on the windows. From and the had Two or three cells in there, I'm sure, maybe four. And so you would, would you boost each other up to look in the no, cell? No, we could, on tiptoe, we could see in the windows. They were that low. Oh, my God. Yeah. Did you ever and, see anybody and get caught? Uh, we saw one person in jail one time, and we didn't know why he was in jail. Of course not. But then I asked my father, why was he in jail? And he said, well, he was probably picked up drunk. <laughs> yeah. Well, so I remember vaguely you talking once about the trains coming across there all the time with the troop trains. Is that when in Selby or Gettysburg? That, or? No, that was in Selby. Um, yes, during the war, the troop trains would come through and very long trains full of soldiers going either direction. Going west, you knew they were going to the Pacific. Going east, you knew they were going probably to Europe. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Hmm. People that had sons in the military at that time got a flag with a star on it for each son that was in the army. Hmm. <clears throat> I remember the newspaper one day talking about the loss of five brothers. Ooh. They were all on the same ship in the Pacific, and the ship was torpedoed, and they lost all five brothers in one family. Oh, my God. And that was really a tragedy. So after that, the Army would not let brothers be on the same no. uh, train or boat, whatever, Yeah, they separated them. Yeah, that makes good sense because you don't want to, yeah. That was a hard lesson to learn. The whole ruling class, so to speak, of a family, the whole mm -hmm. bloodline is gone. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. What about hobos? Did you ever see any hobos? Oh, there? yes, we had hobos. Oh, yeah? Because um, it was during Depression time. Mm -hmm. And early on in the war, we there was a hobo jungle down by the railroad, uh, and it had a pond there because the runoff from the water tank for the engines would leak water and run in there. Uh, pond, and so the hobos would gather down there. It was kind of a nice little place. There was a lot of bushes in there, 
and they would have a fire, campfire, yeah. and it wasn't exactly a camping event, but <laughs> they were yeah. there overnight, and frequently they would come to the houses during the day to see if they could get something to eat. Yeah. Because most of these people were destitute men that were trying to find a living for their families. Yeah. And uh, it hmm. was, mother always tried to give them bread. Yeah. Because she made a lot of bread. Okay. And one time we had a tinker come to the door. Now, a tinker is different was, than the gypsies. Well, he wasn't a gypsy. But they're a little he different. He was a tradesman that came with equipment to mend the holes in your buckets and your cookware. Mm -hmm. And it was a very unique service. And mother had him fix a couple of holes in a couple of pans. And I just sat there and was fascinated by how he did it. And he was nice, and she paid him. Mm. And I don't know what, but, yeah. and I don't know how long he was in town, but the real tinker, kind of one of the last was, of the few. Was he in a car or a wagon? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe he was off the train. Oh. Because people like that couldn't afford a car. Yeah. Because gas was rationed, tires were rationed, everything was rationed. We had ration books. Yeah. Or ration books, whichever way you pronounce it. Mm hmm And, yeah, we had a lot of rationing. Sugar, butter. So we had, if we... We churned our own butter because we had the cows, but if you ran out of butter, you could buy oleo. Yeah. And um, oleo was always sold with a little color packet, and you had to mix the yellow color into the oleo so it looked like butter. Was oleo white in general? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 So you mixed the color packet. Yes. To fool so. people. Uh huh. But you had to do it yourself. Yeah, yeah. All right. So, we are we almost done living in Selby now, and we're going to go to Gettysburg. Um, I mean that's because you. We're about finished with Selby. Yeah, uh, it was a an, a good place to raise a family. Yeah. Everything was community, helping one another during the war, learning to get along without things, or, Can, um, yeah. go ahead, go ahead. May I ask a couple of questions before you move on from Selby? Of course. So, can you specify what years you lived in Selby? What years did you live in Selby? From the time I was four until my age end of my sophomore year in high school. And then that's when we um, moved to Gettysburg. But always, we got into high school in Selby. They had a band. <laughs> and oh, here's the music part. <laughs> and I wanted, I the wanted Selby to- Selby High School. I wanted to yeah. play in that band so bad. I wanted to be the first chair trumpeter because the boy that was was really good, I thought, at that point. <laughs> <laughs> Knowing little about what good was in a trumpet. But So you knew how to play the trumpet? Yeah. And so <laughs> What? What? <laughs> Mom and Dad bought a trumpet for me and I played the trumpet until we moved to Gettysburg and took the trumpet with me. And the band leader, the band leader was also our piano teacher, because we had a piano that Grandma Bell had, and brought it to South Dakota, and, and we all took piano lessons. 
from what? Yeah. So you did have a piano in the house. Yeah, we had a piano in the house. Well, you never mentioned that before, and you haven't talked about taking piano lessons. Well, the <laughs> the guy that we took piano lessons from was also the band leader in Selby, the music leader. And he was a veteran of the Prussian army from the First World War. Wow. So he was a fairly older person. And he really loved his beer. <laughs> and Wasn't he good German wood? Yeah. And he lived in the hotel downtown, and he was not married. Whether he had family, I have no idea, but he had been in the Prussian army. Hmm. So, uh -huh. but he was quite a musician on his own, and hmm. was probably terribly frustrated with <laughs> teaching piano to all these kids. Sometimes he would come to the house, and sometimes we had to go down to the hotel. So be that's living in Eastern Europe at the time, so. Probably, so yeah. that's how we learned to read music yeah. from Barney uh, Wolf. So, what other instruments do you know how to play? You played trumpet and piano. What else? Well, when we moved to Gettysburg, I had to switch from trumpet to a baritone horn. A baritone horn, what's that mean? What instrument is that? It a was a brass, a... it's a brass instrument in the band, and it's uh, between a trombone and a tuba. Right, it's like a giant French horn, right? Yeah. Something or one there. Wow, that's an obscure instrument. Yeah. First I've heard of this. Uh, yeah. Well, <laughs> we never asked, Chris. <laughs> Well, I love to play the old well, pump. We'll get to that, yeah. <laughs> All right, but well, thanks for filling us in on uh, some of the Selby. We'll let you move on now. Did Barbara or Luann or Corbin play? Oh, Corbin played something because he was an army Corbin band. played the drums. Oh, he was a great drummer. And uh, was he? This, really? this kind of goes back now to Gettysburg. Yeah. So, but did Luann and Barbara take piano? Oh, piano? oh yes, we all took piano okay. lessons. Did they play and, any other instruments? <clears throat> well, Barbara played the French horn in the band, and Luann did not play. But we all sang in the school choir. And, and the Methodist church choir? And the church choir, <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, boy. So that was the extent of our music education. At least we had some. Yeah. Well, why didn't Luann play an instrument? I don't know. Hmm. Wow, interesting. So, right. Okay. All right, so we're going to go to, where, where are we going next? Gettysburg, right? We're going to go to Gettysburg. Gettysburg. Yeah, All so. Right. I'm muting myself. Okay. I'll, I'll chime in if I have to. Oh, you betcha. So now we have a slide of the Gettysburg House, and it's a more, it's not, it's a more recent picture, so to speak, because it has one of those TV antennas on top of the house with the million forks on it. But anyway, that's where you lived in Gettysburg, right? Yes. Okay. You notice the basement window toward the front? Yeah. That was for the coal bin. That's what I was wondering, yeah. Yeah. So we still had a coal furnace. Okay. So because I learned to sew so well in 4-H club, I'm sure this is one of the dresses I made in 4-H club. And if you look <laughs> behind me, there is the Philco radio yep. that we listened to the war broadcasts on. And there is a little record player on the top with, that played 45 records. Oh my gosh, what kind of 45 records did you listen to back then? 
I have no idea. <laughs> Popular ones, oh, whatever sure. they were. Yes. Whoever the but musicians were back then, which my memory will have to look up. I don't know. Right. So that's in the house in Gettysburg. And check out your oh, check saddle out. shoes and white bobby socks. Oh, absolutely. I died to get those shoes. saddle shoes. Oh, yes. And they, of course, weren't very comfortable, but I would never tell anybody that. Because <laughs> I worked so hard, lobbied so hard for them. <laughs> Did you? <laughs> How old are you there? Probably a junior in high school, maybe? A junior or senior, probably, yeah. 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 Huh. Wow, okay. And now, oh, here's another swell picture of you uh, modeling out in front of the house. Right. <laughs> I don't know what the occasion was, but... It was it's very, very fashionable. <laughs> yeah. It looks like you got some of your Hollywood glamour clothes finally. Yes. Mm. Well, we need to back up to the move. Okay, yeah. To get us work. All right. All of a sudden, everything went haywire because we were moving. I couldn't believe we were going to move and leave our high school and our friends. <laughs> and the truck was there, and they loaded, started loading furniture, and I thought, I'm not going. Oh, you're not going, are you? I'm going to stay here. Well, who are you going to live with? Well, maybe I can live with the Clements. That was our one of my friends. <laughs> and so they just kind of left me and didn't argue about it because they knew <laughs> that I would be moving. <laughs> they just so. left you standing there on the curb and drove off? <laughs> no. That's something Dad would do. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh oh. So you didn't want to move, and Grandpa got a job transfer well, or what? No, Grandpa had bought the International Harvester uh, Farm Equipment Store in Gettysburg. Oh. Because he had resigned from the county agent's position because he knew he had to sit, educate his three daughters. So he needed more money. He wanted, had to have more money. Yeah. And so he sold International Harvester machine equipment in Gettysburg, and that's why we moved. Oh. But when we moved, there was no housing available in Gettysburg. So that benefactor who was a rancher and a very, very, very good friend forever, had an empty house on one of his acreages. Did Grandpa's he have benefactor? He loaned money from to dad to yeah. do this. Yeah, I know Chris, but I didn't know he was considered a benefactor. Well, in today's terms. In today's terms, all right. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> so we moved into this house, had, of course, had no plumbing. <laughs> oh, God. It did uh, have in, electricity. In the yeah. greater Gettysburg area, or was it, it? No, it was out in the country, out of Gettysburg. And it was, so oh, two or three miles from town. And we had one car, so Dad would have to take the car into town every day. So that left the rest of us out there in the country. But how did you Luann, get to school? Luann got a job with one of the ranch families, keeping house, sort of cleaning, and because they had a big ranch and people to feed. Um, I learn to sell parts to farm equipment of uh, farm equipment parts in the store there were bins three rows of bins with parts for all of these machines and you had an inventory book so i learned to do that so i would help in the summer with the selling parts 
and um, that wasn't every day, but frequently. Mm -hmm. And Barbara just kind of, I don't know what she did. But anyway, we lived in that house, and we were still in the house after school started, because we all had to get in the car and go to town at the same time. But one time in the summer, after we had moved, there was a lady that came to the door. She had a car, and she was selling Irish lace. <laughs> what she was doing out here, I have no idea. But mother had gone to the bathroom, out to the outhouse, in only her underwear. And <laughs> in only her this, underwear? Just in her underwear. Okay. And here was this woman come to the door, and mother was in the bathroom, in the outhouse. So what were we to do? <laughs> It was a conundrum. So we kept the woman engaged and brought her into the house in the living room. And then one of us went out to the toilet to tell mother she could come in and quickly go up the stairs and get some clothes on. <laughs> oh, God. It was quite an event. I bet. I don't think we bought any Irish lace tablecloths. <laughs> Probably not. So no. that was uh, one of the adventures of living in the country. Yes. So how long did you live in that country house in Gettysburg with no well, plumbing? Again. <laughs> then we uh, had to make another move because it was too inconvenient with everybody in school. Right. So we moved into town to another empty house with no plumbing. <laughs> Jesus. And um, this one was in the winter. <clears throat> and this house was kind of a shell. It had no insulation, had no sheetrock. It just had the outside and two by fours. Oh my goodness. <clears throat> but it had a kitchen. It had a kerosene stove, and <clears throat> some kind of furnace, but it was a fairly large house, and the furnace just wasn't able to heat the whole house, especially the upstairs. Mm. Oh, that upstairs was cold, because this was midwinter. <sighs> and <clears throat> We had Christmas there, and at New Year's, we had this horrible blizzard. It was like 20 below, and the wind chill must have been 40, but we were determined. We had a date to go to the dance on New Year's Eve. So there was no way you could drive anywhere. Everything was drifted closed. And where was so, this dance to be held? In the town auditorium. Okay. The town had an auditorium, which was also the basketball gym. So, so at least you and Luann were in high school at that point. And Barbara. Barbara was too? Yeah. Okay. I don't think Barbara had a date for this one. But the boys had to come get us, and we had to walk to wherever their car was, and then go to the dance, which we danced. And my date was the super jock of the school. Oh my God. And jocks don't dance. And why did you go with them, Mom? <laughs> oh, because it was a big deal. Yeah. And I don't think it was too well received by some of the local girls, because... Oh, because you're the new girls in town. I was the, we were the new girls in town. And, yeah. But one of the boys in my class in high school from in Gettysburg was a marvelous dancer. And he would always ask me to dance. And we danced 
the whole dance and my date would sit there. <laughs> what about the dancer's date or did he just come to dance with all these girls? Well, no, Jerry liked to dance with me. He danced with a couple of other girls too, but we just had the same rhythm and we just, I loved dancing with him. And I regretted that the stupid jock <laughs> didn't <laughs> dance, almost dumped him to go with this other kid that could dance. So, but no, I wouldn't, uh, no. But did Jerry bring a date to that dance and ditch her to dance with you? I don't know if he brought a date, if he did. Didn't dance with her much. Maybe she, <laughs> Obviously not. Maybe she would have, should have been dancing with my boyfriend. So the jock was your boyfriend at that oh, time? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. No wonder all the girls hate you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I finally made amends with him for some reason. <laughs> yeah. Because we were in band together, and we were in chorus, and everything you did was togetherness. <clears throat> yeah. So... Yes, in Gettysburg. And then I got a job. Then finally, the house that we bought was the people moved out because their new house was ready. Oh. But oh, what a relief to get into that real house with real plumbing and a bathtub. Mm. Oh, goodness. That was what a relief. Yeah, that'd be so. kind of sucky to be that old in high school and have to go to the outhouse. Yeah. Well, yeah. We weren't the only ones. I'm sure a lot of those farm kids never had indoor plumbing for years. Yeah, but when you're used to having a little bit and then have to go back to the outhouse, yay. Oh. Uh, well, what was the option? I know. I know. Yeah. Hmm. Huh. So that was a quite an, uh, uh, stupid thing to do, to be even be out on... New Year's Eve one and it's a howling blizzard and so cold. Yeah. So but you know, you're in high school, you do those things. Yeah. <laughs> Dumb high school things, yeah. 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 So any other highlights from your high school days in Gettysburg before you graduated? Well, it was I was a soda jerk and worked at Jones Drug. So I had a little money coming in for myself. Okay. And one time the men, the businessmen would come for coffee about 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning to the drugstore and sit there and chatter. And it was getting to be World Series time and they were Put it, making a pool for the game, who would win. Mm -hmm. And they said, Helen, do you want to put money in the pool? And I said, oh, I don't think so. And they said, oh, come on, put a dollar in. It won't hurt you. <laughs> so I had a little money there. So I did, I put a dollar in. And after the World Series was over, they came back to the drugstore and said, well, guess who won? I said, who? They said, you won. <gasps> so I won $10. Woohoo! <laughs> Not even really knowing who's playing in the World Series. <laughs> well, I, I don't know who played. Yeah. <laughs> Probably the Yankees and somebody else. Yeah. But. Wow. Yeah. That was nice to have a little extra pocket money. Yes, it was. Ooh. So. I remember one time in the mid-70s, Mother won a raffle, and we got our very first microwave oven. Oh, yeah. That huge microwave oven yeah. that you won, that sat on that mo the dishwasher that we had to roll over to yeah. the, the <laughs> sink to hook up. Yeah. Right. I guess yeah. Mom's been a good bet all along. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps you are correct. Keep, keep going. <laughs> So, um, yeah, it was kind of 
teenage stuff that you did. Mm -hmm. um, Where did you do the work in the um, newspaper where you did set the type block? Oh, that was in Selby. That was in Selby? Yeah. Okay. Um, with one of my friends, yeah. So what did you do? Well, I worked, we would go down, we're back in Selby now. My good friend, parents ran the newspaper. And so after school, sometimes I would go over to the newspaper because she would have to be there. Mm -hmm. And on Thursdays then we had to fold. And I said, well, I'll help you. So we folded the papers and got them ready for the mail and on Thursdays. And so I kind of hung out there frequently at the print shop and they had a linotype so not everything was hand set but all the headlines and all the poster work they did was all hand set type. Oh. So it was very interesting to watch Bruce set the type because it all is backwards and upside down. So. Then I got to run a press one time, one of the poster presses, and that was fun. So I yeah. learned a little bit about the printing process. So that and might have planted that first seed for you to learn all about the Gutenberg press and all the other bookmaking right. and everything. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So. Hmm. Yep. Okay. So you graduated at Gettysburg High School. Yeah. In what year? Fifty one. Fifty three. Oh. So that fall. Far? Yeah. Fifty. Yeah. So, since we apparently have to ask Mother the right questions. <laughs> so, Mother, when did you start? painting and doing artwork independently. Did your mother paint at home? She was quite talented. Well, that gets way in the future. Mother did not, didn't, mother did not didn't. paint until we were all gone from home. Then she had time to paint, and so that's when she started painting. Mm -hmm. so, okay, so did you start painting in high school, grade school, college? <laughs> we had no art classes, never had an art class. Um, so I didn't do any painting until mother died and I got her watercolors. And I thought, I think huh. I'd like to try. So then I started drawing and painting. I always liked to draw and, uh, and color when we were growing up, we had crayons, of course. Hmm. Can I skip back and ask you, who, who was it that drew the hopscotch grids? What? Who drew the hopscotch who? grids on your sidewalk? Oh, we did. Was it you? Who's we? Luann, you, you oh, Barbara? If, if we were wanted to play hopscotch, whoever wanted to play made the grid. So. Did you make them artistic and colorful? What? Did you make them artistic and colorful? No, we didn't have colored chalk. We were lucky to have a piece of white chalk. <laughs> <laughs> a lump of coal. We probably <laughs> filtered it from school, or All filched right, well, it I'm, from. I'm just curious because you became such a really good artist that I'm wondering when that started and how. What? He Did, said he was no. curious because you've become such a good artist and he wondered when that started and how. So well, I've always been that. always been interested in art, but as far as art to classes, never never crossed the, my mind that they would teach art in school. They sure didn't. <laughs> so did they in college? Well, yeah, they had art classes in college, but I didn't have time to take any. Yeah. Okay. So now we need to find out why Mother decided to go to Colorado Women's School yep. and major in music, and where the heck is Colorado Women's School? Okay, yeah, that's kind of the next grouping, the next segment here. Carry on, dear ones. Okay. <laughs> so 
This picture is of you in a fancy formal dress. Yes. But well, when I enrolled in Colorado Women's College, they started sending information, and you had to have a formal. So, didn't have. I had a formal for high school. Yeah, not the, the same. same one. And it was so scratchy. Oh. <laughs> put it on and it had scratchy stuff around the armpits and the chest all of, uh, yeah. everywhere. And I, was, I wasn't about to take that one, so I made one. Got a deal on this fabric. It's quite and pretty. It was a nice, it was very pretty. Yeah. So I made a strapless formal of all things. Oh, I see that. Strapless yeah. formal from South Dakota. Hooey. It was um, in two pieces. The top was separate, but it tucked under. Oh. Um, the skirt had a velvet waistband on, which was attached to black net. So it was quite fancy. Yeah. And so that was my formal for college. Okay. And so thought, in theory, you could have, um, since it was a two separate pieces, you could have worn a long sleeve black shirt if it was cold <laughs> well, with a skirt instead of that. That was not in the fashion. Oh, excuse me. At that time, no. I was just being too practical. Right. Mm -hmm. This is, a, again, a reflection back to your Hollywood magazines that you and Luann like to look at as yep. children. <laughs> Right. Okay, so how did you decide to go to Colorado Women's College in Denver, Colorado? Well, oh my gosh. I did not want to go to Brookings or Vermilion. For some reason, I just didn't want to go there uh, because Luann had uh, gone to Iowa. There, She was tuition free because uh, she went into nursing and they needed nurses so badly that they uh, dropped the tuition for nursing students. Oh. So that's why she went to Iowa. And I was in our school library at Gettysburg, <laughs> such as it was, and there were some college catalogs laying around. Mm -hmm. And there was, and I started looking at the different colleges and thinking, no, no, no. And then I saw the Colorado Women's College, and I thought, um, well, that would be a different experience. I, I kind of think I'd like to go to Denver to school. So we wrote to Denver and found out how much it cost, and it was going to be more expensive than Luann's Iowa education. Free college, yeah. 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 So, but we... We did it. I think the folks um, let me go there to get me away from my boyfriend because they were really kind of afraid that I was going to marry him. And was this the my... jock boyfriend or somebody else? Huh? Was that the jock boyfriend? That was the jock boyfriend, You yeah. stayed dating him for two years? Oh, yeah. We went steady. What was his name? Dwayne. Jensen. Oh, that's right. Dwayne. Yeah. Oh. So anyway, I never in my brain ever thought I would marry him, but I never told my folks that. If they asked the right question, they would have found out. <laughs> yep, it's always, well, you didn't ask the right questions. And I think they were so glad to get me that far away from him, because then he went down to the University of South Dakota and played basketball down there. Mm -hmm. He got a scholarship. So, yeah, it was really an interesting experience. Um, well, what were your living situation down there? Because oh, that's how you met Ruby and Dixie, right? Yeah, it was very, very lovely. Treat Hall was a dormitory, and it was the old dormitory. Very traditional oak. Uh, woodwork and all of, the, all of that. Mm -hmm. And um, the other two dormitories were newer, but I 
had was just arbitrarily assigned to treat Hall, the old one. And that's Ruby and Dixie and Anne were sweet mates. So there were two, two rooms sharing one bathroom. So that was a suite. And so that's how I met those. But did you have like a little living space? And with like well, a living was, room and like two bedrooms on each side? No, it was just two bedrooms. And there was a common area where yeah. you could go to smoke. Oh. <laughs> Yay. Yeah. No thanks. But yeah. And so, so who is your roommate? Ruby or Dixie? Eventually, it was oh. Ruby. Okay. The, my first roommate was from Hawaii because they asked if you would be willing to room with somebody uh, from a different country. Oh, yeah, I was. Different country? Well, they had international students. Because Hawaii didn't become a state till 59. Yeah. Well, anyway, I was assigned to uh, room with Meg, and she was from Hawaii. And there were a couple of other girls from Hawaii, and she was so homesick that she wanted to room with them. Okay. So they changed it around so she could room with the Hawaiian girls. And then I had the roommate was Helen Chin. She was from Beijing and spoke very good English. In the early 50s? Uh-huh. Wow. And um, she was a lovely person. But again, there were a couple of other Chinese students, and she just wanted needed to live with her own kind. Mm -hmm. So it was culture shock for them oh, more yeah. than me. Yeah, oh yeah. And um, then Ruby was the next roommate and that settled things down. Yeah. So we were roommates in the next two years. Okay. I think mm -hmm. there's a picture of her in here, yeah. So, anyway, so, um, oops, wrong direction. Question. Question. Question? I've, I've acknowledged what? When you were at Colorado Women's College, you were majoring in music, is that correct? Yes. What instruments were you playing then? Oh, dear. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> this was probably... Oh, I never should have signed up for this, for a music degree. <laughs> but it was very interesting, and I wish I had realized uh, what was going on with the teachers. Because this was, of course, 1953, 54 was my first year there, mm -mm. or 54 to... No, because you got married in 56. Well, just... Uh, this is all compressed. So I must have graduated in 52. So 53 to 54 was my first year. Because Dad graduated from high school in 1950. And, and he's two years older than you. So. Yeah, okay. Anyway. Get straight, um, Mom. <laughs> the music teachers were, because I was determined I was going to play the organ. Uh, the organ teacher was Jewish, which I didn't realize. Never been raised around anybody. Um, her husband was a Jewish doctor, and they had fled Vienna hmm. in time to get away from the Germans. And the other music teacher was also from the Vienna Symphony. He played violin. Huh. And he and his wife, Carol, got away in time to escape the Germans. And he, they were very Jewish. Huh. And uh, so both of them were very good friends in Denver. Sure. And uh, they were, oh, so skilled and so good at what they did. And then they had to deal with these 
kids from the hinterlands, basically. There were girls from Kansas and Oklahoma and Idaho and South Dakota and Montana, all these little town girls. And, but they persisted and some of the girls were from Denver and they, of course, had a, an immense advantage because they already had music in their backgrounds, mm -hmm. far more than I did. Sure, yeah. Yeah. Huh. So it was a struggle for me because I had to, <laughs> the Barney, not Barney, but the professor of strings, I had to learn how to play a violin if I was going to be a music major. I'd never even seen a violin. <laughs> God. So that was a real eye opener for him, I think. <laughs> These and little me. farm girls coming into the big city that don't know what a violin is, okay? Uh -huh. uh, yeah. And uh, apparently, Howard Cowhands did not have a bluegrass band. No, <laughs> there was Howard's no. Cowhands did not have a bluegrass band. No. No, there was no band at all. It was all orchestra and choral. So, <laughs> but um, yeah, it was a struggle because most of the girls in the program, music program, had extensive backgrounds in music, and here I was. And I think they kept me in the program simply because they needed the count to, and uh, have maintained the program. Mm. So, yeah. <laughs> oh, it was interesting. It really yeah. was. Yes, I lived with our good friend Steve Patton while he was getting his music degree, and it was grueling for him. What? Very He's, hard discipline to get a music degree. He oh. was referencing yeah. when he lived with Steve and Bozeman, uh -huh. and he was working on his music degree, and it was very grueling. Yes, yeah, it was. And then when I got to Missoula, um, I never should have been accepted into their music program. <laughs> well. um, but I was, and it was. Uh, they had practice oh, rooms. Uh, uh, okay, but you skipped a whole bunch of the part about how you met Dad and moved to Missoula. Right yeah, well, there. we're not we're not done with the Denver <laughs> section. We have a couple things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you, yeah, okay. I appreciate you, Mother. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so um, now there's also a picture coming up of you and Ruby flipping pancakes. Yeah. Okay, so where's that? <laughs> well, here is Ruby on the left and me and a big pancake griddle full of pancakes. This is in Gettysburg. I took Ruby home to Gettysburg the first Easter. And she said she came from a small town, which was Bellingham, Washington. But when she got to Gettysburg, she had a new experience in a small town. And <laughs> One day we were downtown, the, about the first day, and she said, well, where's the rest of the town? And I said, well, what do you mean? I said, this is it. She said, oh, oh. you did mean small town. Yeah. Did you guys well, take the train up there from Denver? No, we had to take a bus. A bus? Yeah. Oh, boy. They still had a bus. Okay. So um, this, my father then had a pancake breakfast for some occasion for all of his clients and town people. And so the big draw was, oh, Helen and her roommate from college are going to serve uh, pancakes. The big city of Denver. Yes. Woo <laughs> so we did. We made a, flipped a lot of pancakes and served a lot of people. I bet you did. Yep. Dad thought it was great, a great success. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, that looks pretty fun, actually. Oh, this is the the 
great picture from Colorado, Denver. So now Colorado we, Women's College that went in the picture. annual. Is that one of your senior sitting pictures? Yeah. Oh, he's so beautiful. It's hand colored. The photographer colored them all. Oh, he did? Yeah. Oh. Okay, and now we now come to the next graduation. One. And you're in Denver. Colorado Women's College graduation gown. Yeah. Yeah. The only graduation ceremony I ever went through. You didn't go to your high school one? Well, the high school ones, yeah. But this one was the only college graduation. Why didn't you go to your Missoula College graduation? Because I graduated in December. Oh, they didn't have them because it was a winter? No. Oh, so, dear. Oh, yeah. dear. All right, so that's kind of the end of that section. So we can take a break. And then...